Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, Section 2. The Earth No Axial or Orbital Motion. If a ball be allowed to drop from the masthead of a ship at rest, it will strike the deck at the foot of the mast. If the same experiment be tried with a ship in motion, the same result will be observed because in the latter case the ball is acted upon simultaneously by two forces at right angles to each other. One, the momentum given to it by the moving ship in the direction of its own motion, and the other the force of gravity, the direction of which is square to that of the momentum. The ball being acted upon by the two forces together will not go in the direction of either, but will take a diagonal course as shown in the following diagram. Figure 22, this is figure 1 for section 2. The ball passing from A to C by the force of gravity and having at the moment of its liberation received a momentum from the ship in the direction AB will by the conjoint action of the two forces take the direction AD falling at D just as it would have fallen at C had the vessel remained at rest. In this way it is contended by those who hold that the earth is a moving sphere, a ball allowed to fall from the mouth of a deep mine reaches the bottom in apparently vertical direction, the same as it would if the earth were motionless. So far there need be no discussion, the explanation is granted. But now let the experiment be modified in the following way. Let the ball be thrown upwards from the masthead of a moving vessel, and it will take as before of two modified in the following way. Let the ball be thrown upwards from the masthead of a moving vessel. It will partake as before of two motions, the upward and the horizontal, and will take a diagonal course upwards and with the vessel until the two forces expend themselves when it will begin to fall by the force of gravity only and drop into the water far behind the ship, which is still moving horizontally. Diagram figure 23 will illustrate this effect. Section 2, figure 2. The ball being thrown upwards in the direction AC and the vessel moving from A to B will cause it to pass in the direction AD, arriving at D when the vessel reaches B. The two forces have expended themselves when the ball arrives at D it will begin to descend by the force of gravity in the direction DBH, but during its fall the vessel will have reached the position S, so that the ball will drop far behind it at the point H. To bring the ball from D to S, two forces would be required as DH and DW, but as DW does not exist, the force of gravity operates alone and the ball necessarily falls behind the vessel at a distance proportionate to the altitude attained at D and the time occupied in falling from D to H. The same result will be observed on throwing a ball directly upwards from a railway carriage when in rapid motion, as shown in the following figure 24. Figure 24. While the carriage or tender passes from A to B, the ball thrown from A to C will reach position D, but while the ball then comes down by the force of gravity operating alone to the point H, the carriage will have advanced to W, so that the ball will always drop more or less behind the carriage according to the force first given to it in the direction AC and the time occupied in ascending to D, and thence descending to H. It is therefore demanded that if the earth had a motion upon axis from west to east, and a ball, instead of being dropped down a mine or allowed to fall from the masthead of a ship, be shot upwards into the air, from the moment of its beginning to descend the surface of the earth would turn from under its direction and would fall behind or to the west of its line of descent. On making the experiment, no such effort is observed and therefore the conclusion is unavoidable, that the earth does not move upon axis. The following experiment has been tried with the object of obtaining definite results. If the earth is a globe, having a circumference of 25,000 miles at the equator, the circumference at the latitude of London, or 51 degrees, 
will be about 16,000 statute miles. So that the motion of the Earth's surface, if 25,000 miles in 24 hours at the equator, in England would be more than 700 feet per second. An air gun was firmly fixed to a strong post, as shown at A in figure 25, and carefully adjusted by a plumb line, so that it was perfectly vertical. This is figure 25, section 2, figure 4. On discharging the gun, the ball ascended in the direction AC. On discharging the gun, the ball ascended in the direction AC and invariably during several trials descended within a few inches of the gun at A. Twice it fell back upon the very mouth of the barrel. The average time that the ball was in the atmosphere was 16 seconds and as half the time would be required for the ascent and half for the descent, it is evident that if the earth had a motion once round its axis in 24 hours, the ball would have passed in 8 seconds to the point D. While the air gun would have reached the position BH, the ball then commencing its descent requiring also 8 seconds would in that time have fallen to the point H, while the earth and gun would have advanced as far as W. The time occupied being 8 seconds, and the earth's velocity being 700 feet per second, the progress of the earth and the air gun to W in advance of the ball at H would be 5,600 feet. In other words, these experiments, the ball, which always fell back to the place of its detachment, should have fallen 5,600 feet or considerably more than one statute mile to the west of the air gun, proving beyond all doubt that the supposed axial motion of the earth does not exist. The same experiment ought to suffice as evidence against the assumed motion of the earth in an orbit for it is difficult, if not impossible, to understand how the behavior of the ball thrown from a vertical air gun should be other in relation to the Earth's forward motion in space than it is in regard to its motion upon axis. Besides, if it is proved not to move upon axis, the assumption that it moves in orbit around the Sun is useless for theoretical purposes and there is no necessity for either denying or in any way giving it further consideration. But that no point may be taken without direct evidence, let the following experiment be tried. Take two carefully bored iron tubes about two yards in length and place them one yard asunder in the opposite sides of a wooden frame or a solid block of wood or masonry. So adjust them that their axes of vision shall be perfectly parallel to each other and direct them to the plane of some notable fixed star a few seconds previous to its meridian time. Let an observer be stationed at each tube and the moment the star appears in the first tube let a knock or other signal be given to be repeated by the observer at the second tube when he first sees the star. A distinct period of time will elapse between the signals given, showing that the, se that the same star is not visible at the same moment by two lines of sight parallel to each other and only one yard asunder. A slight inclination of the second tube towards the first would be required for the star to be seen at the same moment. If now the tubes be left in their position for six months, the same star will be visible at the same meridian time without the slightest alteration being required in the direction of the tubes. From which result it is concluded that if the Earth had moved a single yard in orbit through space, there would be at least a difference of time indicated by the signals, and the slight inclination of the tube which the difference in position of one yard required. But as no such difference in the direction of the tube is required, the conclusion is unavoidable that in six months a given meridian upon the earth has not moved a single yard and that therefore the earth has not the slightest degree of orbital motion or motion at right angles to the meridian of a given star. It will be useless to say in explanation that the stars are so infinitely distant 
that a difference in the angle of inclination of the tube in six months could not be expected, as it will be proved in a subsequent section that all the stars are within a few thousand miles of the Earth's surface. End section 2. Section 3. The True Distance of the Sun and Stars as it is now demonstrated that the Earth is a plane, the distance of the Sun and stars may readily be measured by plane trigonometry. The baseline in any operation being horizontal and always a carefully measured one, the process becomes exceedingly simple. Let the altitude of the Sun be taken on a given day at 12 o'clock, at the high water mark on the seashore at Brighton in Sussex and at the same hour, at the high water mark of the River Thames near London Bridge, the difference in the sun's altitude taken simultaneously from two stations upon the same meridian, and the distance between the stations, or the length of the base line ascertained, are all the elements required for calculating the exact distance of the sun from London or Brighton, but as this distance is the hypotenuse of a triangle whose base is the Earth's surface and vertical side the zenith distance of the sun. It follows that the distance of the sun from that part of the Earth to which it is vertical is less than the distance from London. In the diagram, figure 26, let LB represent the baseline from London to Brighton. This is figure 26, section 3, figure 1. In the diagram figure 26, let LB represent the baseline from London to Brighton, a distance of 51 statute miles. The altitude at L and at B, taken at the same moment of time, will give the distance LS or BS, the angle of altitude at L or B, with the length of LS or BS, will then give the vertical distance of the sun, S from E or the place which is immediately underneath it. This distance will be thus found to be considerably less than 4,000 miles. The following are the particulars of an observation made a few years ago by the officers engaged in the Ordnance Survey. Altitude of the sun at London, 55 degrees, 13 minutes, altitude taken at the same time on the grounds of a public school at Ackworth in Yorkshire, 53 degrees 2 minutes in the distance between the two places in a direct line as measured by triangulation is 151 statute miles. From these elements the true distance of the Sun may be readily computed and proved to be under 4,000 miles. Since the above was written an officer of the Royal Engineers in the headquarters of the Ordnance Survey at Southampton has furnished the following elements of observations recently made. Southern Station, Sun's altitude, 45 degrees. Northern, ditto, 38 degrees. The calculation made from these elements gives the same result, viz. that the actual distance of the Sun from the Earth is less than 4,000 miles. The same method of measuring distances applies equally to the stars and it is easy to demonstrate beyond the possibility of doubt so long as assumed premises are excluded that all the visible objects in the firmament are contained within the distance of six thousand miles from these demonstrable distances it follows unavoidably that the magnitude of the sun moon stars etc is very small much smaller than the earth from which they are measured and to which, therefore, they cannot possibly be other than secondary and subservient. End of section 3. Section 4. The sun moves in a circle over the earth, concentric with the north pole. As the earth has been shown to be fixed, the motion of the sun is a visible reality, and if it be observed from any northern latitude, and for any period before and after the time of southing, or passing of the meridian, it will be seen to describe an arc of a circle. An object moving in an arc cannot return to the center of such arc without having completed a circle. This the sun does visibly and daily. To place the matter beyond doubt, the observation of the Arctic navigators may be referred to. Captain Perry and several of his officers on ascending high land in the vicinity of the North Pole repeatedly saw for 24 hours together the sun describing a circle upon the southern horizon. End section 4. Section 5. 
Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, Section 2. The Earth No Axial or Orbital Motion. If a ball be allowed to drop from the masthead of a ship at rest, it will strike the deck at the foot of the mast. If the same experiment be tried with a ship in motion, the same result will be observed because in the latter case the ball is acted upon simultaneously by two forces at right angles to each other. One, the momentum given to it by the moving ship in the direction of this effect. Section 2, Figure 2. The ball being thrown upwards in the direction AC and the vessel moving from A to B will cause it to pass in the direction AD, arriving at D when the vessel reaches B. The two forces have expended themselves when the ball arrives at D, it will begin to descend by the force of gravity in the direction D, B, H, but during its fall the vessel will have reached the position S, so that the ball will drop far behind it at the point H. To bring the ball from D to the direction of the two forces, take the direction A, D, falling at D just as it would have fallen at C had the vessel remained at rest. In this way, it is contended by those who hold that the earth is a moving sphere. A ball allowed to fall from the mouth of a deep mine reaches the bottom in apparently vertical direction, the same as it would if the earth were motionless. So far, there need be no discussion. The explanation is granted. But now, let the experiment be modified in the following way. Let the ball be thrown upwards from the mass of its own motion, and the other the force of gravity, the direction of which is square to that of the momentum. The ball being acted upon by the two forces together will not go in the direction of either, but will take a diagonal course as shown in the following diagram. Figure 22, this is figure 1 for section 2. The ball passing from A to C by the force of gravity and having at the moment of its liberation received a momentum from the ship in the direction A, B, will by the conjoint head of a moving vessel, and it will take as before of two modified in the following way. Let the ball be thrown upwards from the masthead of a moving vessel. It will partake as before of two motions, the upward and the horizontal, and will take a diagonal course upwards and with the vessel until the two forces expend themselves when it will begin to fall by the force of gravity only and drop into the water far behind the ship which is still moving horizontally. Diagram figure 23 will illustrate this